What does it mean to be a skeptic? While it often means being critical of dubious claims like miracle cures and fad diets, it can also refer to the philosophical belief that some knowledge just can't be attained. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, five experts discuss these different types of skepticism and, surprisingly enough, where they meet. We begin now by exploring the definition of the philosophy of skepticism. The word skepticism derives from the ancient Greek word skeptikos, which means questioning or doubting. Many skeptical arguments are natural everyday affairs, like when you question someone's evidence for a particular opinion about sports or art or politics. Philosophical skeptical arguments are related to those everyday forms of skepticism. But where those everyday expressions of skepticism are particular, concerning a specific piece of evidence for an individual claim, philosophical skeptical arguments tend to be more general. Philosophical skeptical arguments attack a whole type of evidence, like perceptual evidence or inductive evidence or the evidence of testimony. Generally, what such arguments suggest is that the evidence in question isn't good enough to give us knowledge. So, for example, skepticism about sense perception suggests that the senses fool us into thinking they are providing us with evidence about the world around us. In reality, the skeptic suggests, what the senses offer us is only a false promise. The evidence that the senses provide is, in fact, not sufficient to support knowledge of the world that sense experience seems to describe. The other types of skepticism work similarly. So whether you're dealing with skepticism about the existence of other minds or the existence of God, the nature of skeptical arguments is really to question whether the evidence available is sufficient to support knowledge or belief. Is there anything more intimate or internal than pain, Descartes asks. He continues, And yet I have learned from some persons whose arms or legs have been cut off that they sometimes seem to feel pain in the part which had been amputated which made me think that I could not be quite certain that it was a certain member which pained me, even though I felt pain in it. It seems I can be wrong even about my own body. Indeed, Descartes thinks that I can ultimately be wrong in thinking that I have a body. His acid test for certainty is the hypothesis of an evil demon. Suppose there is some immensely powerful being who seeks to deceive me. I may think that certain events occurred, but the evil demon has planted false beliefs in my mind. The evil demon leads me to think I see something on the horizon, but he's planting false perceptions. I think I can manipulate two hands and two legs, but the evil demon is deceiving me into thinking that I sense and act with a body very different from the body I actually have. Perhaps the evil demon is deceiving me into thinking that I'm the kind of being that has a body at all. You see how devastating Descartes' acid test is. Only something that would survive the hypothesis of an immensely powerful deceiver can be accepted as absolutely certain. Can anything survive such a test? Descartes thinks the answer is yes. Dive directly into the depths of skepticism and you will find a rock of sheer certainty. Descartes thinks he has found that rock. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Now, Descartes was a rationalist. He thought some beliefs can be justified a priori, justified without or before having any sense experience. Conversely, the empiricist maintains that we can't know anything without sense experience. So, not only is it the best way to gain knowledge, it is the only way. The first major empiricist was the British philosopher John Locke, who, in his 1689 book, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, suggested that we are born tabula rasa, as a blank slate. When we are born, our minds contain no ideas, and we only start to form ideas once we have sense experience. Now, by idea, Locke doesn't just mean a revelation, like, I have an idea, let's go get some Thai food. Although that would count as an idea, for Locke, an idea is anything in the mind. Beliefs, sensations, private thoughts, mental talking, etc. A 
according to Locke, we get ideas in two different ways. By sensation, observing the world, and reflection, observing our own mental operations. The former generate simple ideas like heat and solidity, shape and taste. The latter generates ideas of perception, doubting and reasoning. We can combine these ideas to come up with new unique complex ideas, but we can't generate new simple ideas on our own. So ultimately everything in our mind, according to Locke, traces back to something we learned through our senses. So, since knowledge is justified true belief and truth is correspondence with the world, if we want to know how accurate our knowledge is, we need to know whether the ideas in our minds correspond to the way the world is. To put it in Lockean terms, we want to know whether the idea in our minds resemble the properties or qualities in objects that produce those ideas. If we're simply looking for knowledge of the phenomenal world, the world of our experience, then most of the time our experience will do. And that is useful knowledge to have, given that we primarily live in the phenomenal world. But we still need to realize that our perceptions can lead us astray, and we never want to fool ourselves into thinking that experience represents the way the world actually is. For the most accurate knowledge of the way the world is, we need to rely on science, aka natural philosophy. Scientists, and social scientists in particular, have identified two ways for a theory to be valid. Internal validity and external validity. Internal validity means that a theory has successfully established a relationship between a cause and an effect. With regard to internal validity, most scientific research is conducted to test causal relationships. Does A cause B? Does smoking cause lung cancer? Does an increase in advertising cause an increase in sales? Does a low-carb diet cause weight loss? The other type of validity that scientists must concern themselves with is external validity. External validity refers to the generalizability of the findings. How broadly can these findings be applied? Are they limited to situations very similar to the ones in which they were tested? If you are in the business of developing theories, it's more important for the theory to be correct than for it to be generalizable. Ideally, of course, you would like both, but if you had to pick. Now, I'm spending some time talking about this up front because I believe that it is important for you as a consumer of research on human decision-making to critique that research in a responsible and useful way. I am absolutely going to encourage you to be skeptical of all of the research findings I will tell you about. Being skeptical makes you a good scientist and a good consumer of science. You should always be skeptical. A 2017 headline from Cleveland's Box 8 read, two thirds of popular baby food products test positive for arsenic, other toxins. The story said that, quote, according to a report released this week, two thirds of baby food products in the United States test positive for arsenic and other toxins. In the next paragraph, quote, the study was conducted over a period of five months by the Clean Label Project and included samples from 500 infant formulas and baby food products from 60 brands. The USA Today provided very similar alarming text about the number of products that were implicated. Unlike most of the other media outlets, they also mentioned that these findings were not published in a peer-reviewed journal. That was the first tip-off here. The entire story was driven by essentially a press release, a document released to a large number of media outlets, in this case by a nonprofit organization called the Clean Label Project. This same organization had released a similar report about what they characterized as contaminants in pet foods. And actually, on their website, some of the verbiage about their pet food report was copied verbatim into their material about baby food. The source of a health story is important, and it's one of the first things you should look for when you're reading a story. Consider this the first and most important tool in your skeptic's toolkit. Ask yourself, what's the source? 
Traditional, dependable scientific studies are published in what are called peer-reviewed journals, including many you've heard of, the New England Journal of Medicine or the Journal of the American Medical Association. Peer-reviewed means that every publication has been vetted or reviewed for accuracy by peers, in this case, other physicians and scientists in the field. This doesn't guarantee that the study is perfect, but it's an important step and at least one way that legitimate journals try to make sure that what they're publishing is reliable and accurate. Journals also employ editorial staff and statisticians for additional review. The system isn't perfect, but it's far better than accepting every press release as gospel. Every story about this baby food contamination issue should have made clear that the findings weren't from an accredited university or government agency and were based on a non-published, non-peer-reviewed press release. Make sure you think about that when you're reading health stories. What is the source and am I sure that it's credible? Or better yet, expect more than one source for most health stories, not just the scientist who perhaps authored a new paper, but viewpoints from other experts, and I mean genuine experts in the field. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.